Good evening, everyone. I appreciate uh, you being yeah. on. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, just a few minutes ago, please, if you'll make sure that your name on your picture uh, when you've joined on the Zoom call, that you click on the little dots in your profile picture so that you can rename, uh, give us your full name and where you're located. Uh, that will help us uh, keep track of who's on the call, who's joined with us tonight, and be able to reach out and give you some more communications about the Brotherhood if you're not already familiar with it. We do have quite a few uh, uh, invited guests tonight from uh, prospective chapters and, and folks who have been in the Brotherhood for a long time, but we're uh, very excited about the webinar, and I'll open us now in, uh, in prayer first, and then I'll introduce our speakers. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. you. Oh God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for the Holy Church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, especially those who are impacted and the families that are touched by addictions and the loss of lives that have happened from drugs and that are pouring into our country and what we can do as Christians to help stem that tide, that it may please thee to comfort and relieve those people according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. 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 Good evening, everyone, for tonight's webinar. We are blessed to have our speaker, uh, a guest who has been seen on national news regarding this drug crisis that I referenced in our prayers that's facing us uh, all around the country these days. Um, I'm Conrad Jones, the National President of the Brotherhood, and I welcome all of our guests and all of you who are members of the Brotherhood, and thank you all for your uh, joining with us tonight. Mr. Derek Maltz previously served as a senior executive uh, in the federal law enforcement as director of the Special Operations Division, United States Department of Justice. As a former DEA special agent, he has seen firsthand the causes of our fentanyl crisis in the USA, as well as the human trafficking that's happening at our borders. As you'll hear Derek say that this is not a red issue or blue issue. It is a red, white, and blue issue that's impacting America. We need to do all we can to stop it. He's very passionate about this subject and has blessed us to hear from such a knowledgeable source. Uh, Derek comes to us by way of uh, a friend of mine who's a friend of his, and uh, we found out Derek actually lived in uh, the area where I used to in Ashburn, Virginia, and uh, now he's uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, work in this cause, and I, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this. We've uh, statistics show that probably two out of every three families in the entire country, have some way or another, been a tu been touched by addiction or death or illness or financial or legal crisis stemming from drugs in our world. So uh, hopefully that Derek will be able to talk to us tonight about what we can do as members in the Brotherhood to help us at local levels and certainly within our families. So Derek, I will turn it over to you. Hi, Conrad, thank you very much. And I'm gonna go through this stuff very quickly. Appreciate everybody's attention. So I'm up in New York City now. And as you can see, uh, the towers is something I'll never forget. I was in charge of the largest and oldest task force in America, the drug task force in New York City for a couple of years. And then I got the job um, at the Special Operations Division in 2005. My father was 30 years in the DEA. My brother died in Afghanistan. We're very passionate about national security and public safety. I currently work as the executive director of PenLink, 
uh, which is a software company that supports law enforcement around the world. Uh, here's the Special Operations Division. When I got there, there were nine agencies. When I left, there were 30, including NYPD, Australia, Ca Canada, and the UK. Synchronizing efforts against the baddest bad guys in the world. That's what we did. Uh, so I really appreciate the Brotherhood of St. Andrew and certainly Conrad for inviting me tonight uh, to speak to everyone. <laughs> I know you guys are very busy here. Yeah, I'll do that again because I'm very <laughs> good with my, my slides, if you can see it. Uh, so my passion in life right now is supporting law enforcement because they have a very difficult job because the criminal elements are getting more and more sophisticated. And my job and always been to take these bad guys, put them in jail, get them off the streets. That's what law enforcement does. Uh, I'm a big believer in the rule of law. But my passion after work, I started working with families around America. There's nonprofit groups throughout this country, families that are putting grief into action because they're out there educating the public about the dangers of this poisonous fentanyl. This is like nothing we've ever seen in the history of this country. That I can guarantee. This is not a drug crisis. It's a poisoning of America crisis. So we put together collages. We spread them around America. We give them to Congress. We give them to the media. And we're trying to make people understand like this is not anything we've seen. These are young kids as young as 13 years old that are dying in their bedrooms, ordering up one pill uh, on the internet, on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. The, the drug dealer delivers to the house, they die. The parents find them dead in the bedroom. Uh, so they call me the voice of the voiceless because they don't have a voice, these parents. They don't know what to do. They don't know who to turn to. So I've been working really hard to support them. Jackie Robinson had a saying, life is not important except the impact it has on other lives. And we're making an impact. Uh, so when I go on national TV, I always highlight these beautiful young kids. This is Alexandra Capaluto. She was 21 years old. She came home on her, her senior year Christmas break, two days before Christmas. She took one Percocet. She thought it was Percocet, or actually it was a half a Percocet. She ordered on Snapchat, and it was delivered to a house like a pizza delivery, and she died. Uh, it's poison. It's not drugs. It's poison from labs in Mexico, and China's behind it. Stop the death! Last summer, Stop the we went. Stop the death! Stop the death! Stop the. We went in front of the Chinese embassy and we rallied. And this past September, we were at the White House in the National Mall, trying to get awareness because, unfortunately, we're not talking enough about this on national TV. We're not talking about it on mainstream media. It's very political for whatever reason, but it shouldn't be. And I'll explain that. So there's the former director of the DEA Special Ops. You've been keeping really close eyes on this crisis since you retired in 2014, correct? Yes, sir, Dr. Phil. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And the families around America appreciate it as well because we need to spread the awareness. Too many people are mistaking this for an opioid addiction. Mm -hmm. This is a mass poisoning, killing our kids at record levels. And by the way, Dr. Phil, I'd like to say, it's not a red or a blue issue. It's a red, white, and blue issue. And all Americans should care about the kids that are dying. You said that very, very well. This is not a partisan issue. It doesn't have to do with politics. This has to do with our children's lives. And it's poisoning. It's poisoning. So I was on Dr. Phil several times. And there's another episode coming up. And he's a big supporter now. And he's going to continue as long as he's still on the air to spread the message. But... I try to make it really clear that this really is impacting all Americans from all communities, all races, all sexes, obviously. And it's really impacting everyone and it's gotta be taken much more serious. Uh, so several years ago, I went to Ohio and I did a documentary about five years ago because I started seeing this really exploding around America. So you could see some of the stuff that we talked you about. You have this poison being dumped in our country and our communities are suffering. Kids are dropping dead every day of the week. Parents of good kids are going up to their bedrooms, finding their kids passed out dead. I mean, this is a crisis that we've never seen before. So we need a greater sense of urgency. What's happening is they don't, it's not like they have quality control chemists. 
in these houses. They're just mixing it up, trying to make money, so you could be the kid that buys one bag of heroin and you're dead. So at that time, again, this is five years ago, and I'll talk a little bit more about my background, but I started realizing that this was hitting so many people in America. You look at September 7, 2017, Admiral Sandy Winterfell, 40 years in the U.S. Navy, a decorated admiral. His kid was in University of Denver. He got the call as a freshman. The kid died from fentanyl. The following day, a national news correspondent from Fox News, Eric Bowling, the next day in Colorado, his kid died. So we started realizing this is really growing quickly. So let me give you a little bit of background on the history of this. So back in the mid 90s, I call them the corporate cartels because Big Pharma was dumping mass amounts of opioids into America. The Washington Post did a recent story that 100 billion opioids were put into America in a nine year period. So the Colombian cartels started realizing this was a business opportunity. So they started putting very white, pure heroin on the streets of, in America in these little glassine bags, $10 a bag. The kids could now snort it. They turned over the business to the Mexican cartels because they didn't want the vulnerability of being arrested. Then the Mexican cartels took over the business. They started using their existing uh, relationships with these Chinese chemical brokers, bringing chemicals from China into Mexico and also fentanyl directly to the US. And all of a sudden we started seeing mass amounts of deaths. This started in around 2012, which is 10 years ago or 11 years ago now. And that's where we're at now. We have unprecedented level of death in this country. So you guys have heard probably about Big Pharma getting fined, but what you'll never hear is how executives in Big Pharma are going to jail. That's because they're protected. Why? Because it's all about the money. And that's a very sad story. So this is $207 million in cash that was seized in Mexico in 2007. It was seized from a chemical broker who was bringing in chemicals to make methamphetamine in Mexico. And the Mexican cartels recognized that they can make synthetic drugs. So they started bringing in first chemicals to make methamphetamine, and they started dumping all this methamphetamine in America, and then they started going to fentanyl. So in 2006, the Mexican cartels first started making fentanyl. So we saw mass amounts of deaths in America, 2005, 2006. Nobody, including myself, and I was running the largest law enforcement center in America, realized what was going on. But as the drug czar said back then, that they were poisoning the drug supply in America back in 2005, 2006. We shut down the lab in Mexico. Fentanyl kind of went away until 2012. Once again, it was all about the money for the cartels. The Chinese nationals in China started dumping synthetic drugs in America. First, they started with K2 spice bath salts, which are known as synthetic cannabinoids, synthetic cathinones. And we started having mass amounts of emergency room emissions, poison control center calls. No one knew what it was. Then we had national news. We had people dropping in Washington, D.C., in New York City, right outside of Yale, people dead in Chicago because they were smoking these poisonous chemicals from labs in China. Then they went to fentanyl. And DEA was working on this. I was participating even when I was still in a job. We briefed Eric Holder in 2014 on Operation Deadly Merchant because we knew this was a storm coming into America from deadly fentanyl. 911, what's the exact address of your I just came to check on my son. And uh, he was in here uh, sitting on the couch and he ice cold. I need the police and ambulance. <laughs> What's your son's name? <laughs> so that call is what we're seeing all over America. And I'm going to touch on this because people don't watch this on the news. They don't hear about it. We have a tsunami right now of fentanyl pills. They're fake pills that are coming into this country from Mexico. The DEA's latest assessment is six out of 10 pills that they have analyzed have a potentially lethal dose of fentanyl. It only takes two milligrams of fentanyl to kill. That's the equivalent of four grains of salt. Last year, the DEA seized 370 million potentially de deadly doses of fentanyl. 
50.6 million fake pills. You look at this chart, this was done by one of my family groups, Song for Charlie. Unfortunately, the fentanyl deaths of the kids is the fastest growing population. You look here, ages 14 to 23, it's so much more than any other group because the young kids are buying this stuff on the internet. So the families against fentanyl, they have just recently analyzed all the CDC stats and have determined that kids under 14 are dying faster than any other uh, you know, demographic in, the, in America. You look at the stats, it's, it's mind boggling. You, know, you look at the ages one to four, five to 14, from 2015 to 2021, it's massive increases of deaths. Just as recent, this is just two weeks ago or last week, Seattle's running out of dead body storage. 35 deaths in less than a month, in 21 days. So the families are starting these grassroots movements around the country and they're starting to make traction. They're rallying outside of the social media companies. They're putting up billboards all over America. They're actually showing pictures like this, these young kids who are losing their parents, their uncles, right? This is a, a, one of our advocates, Andrea Thomas. She lost her daughter. And you can see she sent a letter to Joe Biden. We need to declare this in a national emergency. They have rallies. Colorado is seeing record level deaths. We have like rally after rally after rally just to spread awareness. They're marching outside of Snapchat headquarters. They're putting out paraphernalia so they can educate America. They're now actually suing Snapchat. A bunch of the families are su suing because of facilitating the death of their kids. So there's a lot of positive movements, but the focus has to be on the cartels in Mexico and China. They're working in a deadly partnership. And let me make this clear. In the history of this country, we have never had any terrorist organization kill this many Americans. Right now, if you look at September 11th, you look at Iraq and Afghani war, my brother came back in a body bag. So I'm very passionate about this. There was only 10,000 dead. Last year alone, they estimate around 107,000. That's one death every five minutes, 9,000 per month. These kids, our future generation are dying. So as these gangs are taking over our cities, let me tell you about the Mexican cartel so you understand. It's an army. It's not like anything we've ever seen. It's not a drug cartel. It's a terrorist organization. They're dropping actual drones with C4 explosives on their adversaries. 9,000 drones came into America last year from the cartels. They can attack our border patrol any day of the week. I would say that we are in a national crisis. This is an emergency. It's an emergency. That's the administrator of DEA. And she said it was an emergency a, a year and a half ago when she first got on the job. Let, let's just take a look at what's happening. Look at this beautiful kid, 23-year-old model out in L.A. And as his mother, last time with him, holding his hand. Here's a little 12-year-old boy that got into his, his parents' stash dead. Jose. Here's a 13-year-old Spanish kid he was from a good Colorado. Kid. He was always his smiling. His last words, Jose hey, mommy, Hernandez's I love you. smile is one that his... Okay, I'm not going to show the whole video. So one night down in Florida, there were five or six cadets from West Point that overdosed, poisoned by fentanyl. And I got called on national news at night and in the morning. And I was really upset because I'm concerned about all the kids, not just the West Point cadets, to make it a sexy story on the news. You look at the mass overdoses, and I'm gonna go through this quickly, but you're not gonna believe what's happening. So the DEA administrator in April of 22, she announced all the mass overdoses. That's multiple deaths in one area at one time. So it first started in our nation's capital. January, we had nine dead. Then we had 10 dead later on. And this is right down from the White House. And then we just started tracking all these deaths around America, in Missouri, in Colorado, in Nebraska, more in Colorado, in Texas. And then I started tracking them closely. Ohio State, pre-med, 21-year-old kid, takes what she thinks is Adderall, and it turns out it's fentanyl, and she's dead in her dorm room. And her buddy, her friend died as well. And you look at El Paso, nine in 36 hours. St. Paul, Minnesota, nine in 24 hours. His July 4th weekend last summer, They'd never seen anything like it. Nine dead in Gagston County, northern Florida. Gwyneth County of Georgia, 41 overdoses they had in a very short time. Six dead in Alabama, okay? 
Here's Onondaga County, upstate New York, 14 poisonings in one day. This is in August, okay? Then I can't even keep track. I track this every day. Hamilton County, Ohio, 16 dead in the first five days of October. You could just look at this. Three brothers died in a house together in Colorado. It's overwhelming. And I track this every day of the week. Five fentanyl poisonings in, in, in Los Angeles. Here's another two. In high school, it was national news. They were dropping in the middle of the school and at the vending machines. Four more dead in a, in a county in South Carolina. And then you look at what's happening in South Carolina. You have these massive arrests being made. They had seven pill presses in the house. And they were making this stuff in the streets of South Carolina. More in Dayton, Ohio, right? 14 poisonings in a week. Broome County, upstate New York, December, seven dead in 11 days. Christmas Day, six people. They were treated for mass overdoses of Christmas Day in San Francisco. Back in Onondaga County, upstate New York, right before Christmas, there were 24 in a 24-hour period. Okay, and then we had 14 in a 36-hour period. Chicago, January 24th, in a bar on a Sunday, five or six went down. Here's the, rate, the most recent one I have in here, just last week. Montana, eight deaths in 10 days. So it's all over the country. It's skyrocketing. And the American public doesn't even know what's going on. It's sickening. Here's a high school in Connecticut. I'm, I'm sorry, a middle school. Early in the year, the kid brings 40 bags of fentanyl into the school. He had 100 bags back in his bedroom at home. And, and the school became a hazmat scene in America. And we're not paying attention to this. Now, here's a really important thing for everyone in the room. Many kids in America like to take Adderall. They get prescriptions. It's a very good drug for ADHD. Unfortunately, we have an Adderall shortage. So kids are turning to the internet. They go into the streets and this stuff is tainted. This is grandma watching a 15-month-old baby in Georgia. Baby's dead. Here's a little beautiful girl, okay? She, she doesn't have a father anymore. He was a DEA agent. I worked with the... I worked with the, with the grandfather. The father, uh, the grandfather called me. I worked with him. His 40-year-old son died, and this is his beautiful daughter he left behind. So they had rainbow color for the first time. So the cartels were making this stuff looking like candy to, to appease our kids. But I want to show you the seizures now, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Here's July, 1 million in California, 62% increase from last year. Here's another million at the border in Nogales. Here's more of the fentanyl pills. DEA administrator had to put out a warning because we started seeing the color pills all over the country. These are just, I could go on all day. It was like every city in America, these colorful pills looking like Skittles or candy, Colorado, DC, Cleveland, right? Then they started putting them in nerds packages, Skittles in Lagos because they were concealing them so they didn't get caught. This is another 1.6 million pills that were seized at the border. Massive drug bust along the Arizona border this week. Border Patrol agents seized more than $4 million worth of fentanyl during a vehicle stop Wednesday. Agents arrested two U.S. citizens. That was August. Then we went to September, another million pills, biggest in the history of New Mexico. All right. This is the biggest in the history of Phoenix. Another million pills in September. Another in November, 700,000 plus. Now we have the most recent ones. You look at Border Patrol season, like a million pills, it seems like every other, every other week. And so far in the first three months, this fiscal year, they seized more than all of last year. You look at some of the smuggling techniques, they put it on their waist. This lady had 40, 000, or 10,000 pills around, around her, uh, her waist, and it was 40,000 in a battery. This dog had to sniff out you know, 250 pounds of fentanyl in spare tires. His potato chips, his crutches. The guy comes over the border. He's got 14,000 pills in his crutches. Here's the dogs getting the stuff that was sitting in the uh, bread, coming in bread. So look at this now. This is the sheriff in Orange County, California. Last five years, 2,200% increase in fentanyl-related deaths in California. San Diego had 2,375%. Off the charts, in Franklin County, Ohio, 90% of the deaths, the overdose deaths is fentanyl. So don't listen to these stats. They talk about, you know, 60% or whatever, it's much higher. So it's all over the place. We have a deadly partnership between the cartels and China. It's like playing Russian roulette for the kids, but it's worse. 
because the kids have no idea they're going to die. You cannot treat somebody in the morgue. It's too late. Now, this one slide will tell you the entire problem. In 2015, DEA Phoenix, they seized zero Mexican fake pills in Phoenix, Arizona. Last year, 25 million pills. Remember, six out of 10 can kill. This is the actors, the police officers, the, the young kids that are dying. Here's the professional athletes, Jimmy Hayes, hockey player, Boston Bruins. Here's all the hockey players, professional football players, college football players, Heisman Trophy, baseball players. They're dying. They bring the pill presses from China. They make this stuff in their bedrooms. And this is why. You make 7,000 pills an hour, $20 a pill, 140,000 an hour, a million a day in pill sales. And kids are addicted. The country is very depressed, a lot of anxiety, and kids are turning to the pills. Watch this video. He never intended for me to find him on his bedroom floor. He never intended for his dad to administer CPR, trying to save his life. Alex didn't intend for me to see him wheeled away on a stretcher and put into an ambulance. Alex had no intentions of me seeing him lying on a stainless steel table covered with a sheet with only his head showing. Alex had no intentions of me knowing what it felt like to kiss his face for the last time. That's Amy Neville. I work with her closely. I get her on national news. I get her to Congress and you can see the video. It's called Dead on Arrival. It's the best documentary I've seen. It's 20 minutes. I recommend everyone watch this video with their kids and grandkids because it's really strong. So this powerful pill is a chemical weapon. It's killing our kids. China is behind it. And we're seeing body bags everywhere. Over 100,000 last we year. We are so focused right now on stopping the chemicals coming out of the Chinese chemical companies. China's to blame. Chinese chemical companies are the largest... So the Mexicans used their, their uh, chemical brokers that were selling chemicals for years to make methamphetamine, and now they're making fentanyl. And you can see, like, this is an example. It's not just fentanyl. This is 17,500 pounds of meth in one day in November of last year. One, last, one thing I want to tell you is that I'm not going to get into this in detail. It's a little confusing. But the Chinese now are the biggest money launderers in America for the cartels. And they're buying real estate, property, and investments all over our country, which is a huge national security threat. And they're using the kids that are here today on student visas to pick up the money from the cartels. I can answer questions about that. They give the money to the Chinese business owners. They go to the casinos. They then use very sophisticated encrypted apps, WeChat Pay. They transfer money. They order up consumer goods. They ship the goods to Mexico. They sell the goods, they make profit, they pay the cartels very quickly. And they use Bitcoin as well. So it's very, very advanced. Uh, they're washing the money through the, the sophisticated systems. This is one case, Atlanta DEA was up on a wiretap of a Mexican cartel leader. And during the wiretap, this Chinese guy from Flushing, New York came down, picked up $350,000. This is my son, Alexander. This is our daughter, Jessica. This is my daughter, Alex. This is my son, Daniel Joseph Puerta Johnson. This is going to continue until we do something differently in this country and we need all Americans to fight together. So I went to Ohio. I testified uh, in court uh, in Congress in Ohio to declare the cartels as terrorists back in 2019. Um, and the reason is because we've never seen this ever in the history of the country. This is one of my friends, Andrea James. She's at her son's grave site on his birthday on Mother's Day. Uh, and this is our Congress. You know, this is Republicans and Democrats. Tim Ryan is no longer in Congress, but they had a bipartisan bill to declare fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction. And there's some movement now on that. Former Attorney General Barr is now coming out and saying, we have to be more active against the cartels. They have to be treated as a terrorist organization. They cannot continue to operate and poison our country. And the other thing that's happening, just so you know, and this really makes me upset because in Tulare County, California, these two guys were, were stopped with 150,000 of these deadly pills and they were released. They went back to Mexico, they're fugitives. That's the same county where two weeks ago we had six people shot 
dead, executed, including a 10 month old baby and our six and his 16 year old mother. Okay, because this is all drug related. This is another case in New York in November, 20,000 pills, they were both released. Too many of you are buying pills on the internet and dying because almost half of them are laced with lethal doses of fentanyl. This shit has to stop. It doesn't take much. Derek, show them. One gram of sugar. If this was fentanyl, 500 Americans dead. Stop doing it and tell your friends. So we got Dr. Phil on board doing some videos, trying to get the messaging out. We have some good things going on right now. We have task forces around the country that are prosecuting these people for death. Uh, this is one of my families that we work with. Son Zach was going to go to Stanford or UCLA. And Chris and Laura Didier were in the courthouse when the guy got sentenced to 17 years for killing Zach. This is beautiful Lauren uh, Cole from uh, West Virginia. Right before she died, she told her father, hey, dad, please set up a rehab center in West Virginia. All my kids are getting sick. All my friends are sick. They need help. So this guy, after she died, he created Lauren's Wish. And it's now he, he, uh, he raised money to have like a wing of a hotel where he has a rehab center and he provides help to these kids out in West Virginia. Um, recently, the killer of Lauren was sentenced to 15 years. This is Andrea Thomas. Her, her daughter's killer was sent to life, sentenced to life. This is our friend, Jimmy Rao, the family is against fentanyl founder. He's out there. He's suing companies in China. He's, he's got a national movement going. Uh, this is a new drug called nitazine and utiline, utilone and xylazine. This is being mixed into fentanyl. So it's something coming out of labs in China. And it's very, very potent opioids. It's another part of their unrestricted warfare to destroy America. This is a Long Island lacrosse player. We thought he died from a fentanyl pill, and it was actually uh, adenitazine, which is a very dangerous synthetic opioid. Uh, this trank stuff is now picking up. It's an animal tranquilizer, and they're putting it in the fentanyl on the streets, and it's causing amputations. It's causing lesions and all kinds of really, really bad things to these kids. You can see it all over the news now. They're starting to carry it more, especially in Pennsylvania and in Kensington. This is, this is the last thing I'm going to show you is a commercial that the parents made. Watch this one. So the parents are making these public service announcements because the government's not doing it. I don't know why they're not doing it. So I'm going to continue to support the parents and law enforcement. Uh, they're saving lives because every time they make these million pill seizures, they're saving hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, so I thank everyone here. I'm going to leave it open for questions. But I will say, as law enforcement is united, as their cops are being killed, their brothers and sisters are being killed at record levels, the community leaders like this brotherhood needs to get together and start being advocates as well, uh, because this is an example of what we're facing. This is a lab in Mexico. It was producing 70 million fake pills a month coming into our country. Here's the most recent seizure in Mexico, 3 million pills. It was all in these coconuts coming to our country. We recently got uh, the arrest, the indictment of one of the leaders of the CJNG cartel, one of the brothers. So there is some, some things happening, but just not enough. So I'm going to leave you with this point, because you're going to hear more about this on national news. So if you had a major water leak in your house, the first thing you have to do is shut off the main valve. Well, right now, the country is being flooded with deadly fentanyl. It's coming from Mexico, from the dangerous Mexican cartels. We must shut down their supply line, period. 
There is no debates about this because it's going to save our future generation. Here's some of my information. I'm all over social media. I participate in national news on a regular basis. I've been doing this for like about five, six years now, pushing the messaging. I will be involved with congressional testimony as we start moving forward with this stuff. But I post everything. Every time I'm on, I put on my YouTube channel. I have Facebook groups, national security. I'm just trying to get the word out. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. I know that's a lot of information. I hope you learned something from this. And I hope we can get everyone on this call to start advocating to support these families and save our kids. Thank you, Derek. I really appreciate it. If if I know it was uh it was a lot to digest. Um, it is a significant, uh, just a horrible issue that we have in our country. I know personally, in the last three years, I've had I've lost two nephews, both to fentanyl um, wow. poisoning, and um, it is uh, an epidemic that is poisoning a younger generation and uh, a middle generation, but particularly the young people that are buying them online. I'm going to leave some time here. Uh, we've got one person that's raised their hand. I'd ask if y'all want to ask a question, please raise your hand in the, uh, if you go down to uh, where the chat box is, where you're, uh, you can raise your hand on your uh, Zoom screen. Brother Harry Johnson, uh, he has his hand uh, raised. So Brother Johnson. Yes, good afternoon, brother, and good afternoon, uh, your presenter. Um, as someone who works in the field on a daily basis, substance abuse and mental health, work with kids, and I know initially the problems start with pharmaceutical company, and it started in the suburbs, and then we started to have the, then it started to see the other countries may see that it was an easy access, now there were punitive damage to the pharmaceuticals, so now they're coming in. But my thing was, there was a war on drugs. In back in the early, the late 90s and 80s. And I think the guys just said the government is not doing things, but the government was able to institute policy to crack it down. So right now there is a change of demographics. Honestly, I'm just gonna say, you know, I work and I've seen it, young people I've seen, I know that some of my patients that comes in who are on, on cocaine and opiates, it's mixed with, with federal, there's no doubt about it. But at the same time is, is, is the policy and funding that is cutting for treatment from the government. And it's not only this government, I'm saying previous government. So we talking about shutting down the main stuff, it has to do with fun funding. And so right now we're seeing a different shift in who is more affected and how we're gonna come about bringing laws. So when you talk about laws, implementing laws and all this funding and bringing in money and all that thing, it has to be community. There has to be a lot of um, education to the young people blast it out there because as you said, I'm aware and in New York where I work in New York City that it's a problem, but I think over the suburb and the other other country, cities and state, it's a big thing, but now we know what's going on. So how do you address in terms of sh shifting policies? So first of all, Harry, you're from Brooklyn, right? Yeah, I'm a how, yeah. how you doing, my man? I'm from Long Island and I appreciate your comments. Number one, education is just non-existent. And this is not about the current administration only. I watched it over the last several years. They just totally stopped talking about drugs. They didn't educate the kids in school. And unfortunately with the synthetic drugs, it just got worse because these are not the drugs from the seventies. This is not the marijuana from the seventies. This is much more powerful, much more deadly. And the substances now are killing at record levels. So there has to be a change in policy. There must be significant resources applied to treatment, education, and rehabilitation. And unfortunately, we have so many people in America that are addicted to opioids, right, that, that it's been going on for many years. Like I said, the corporate cartels, as I say, they dumped 100 billion opioids into America. So a kid goes in to get root canal, and instead of getting some Tylenol or some Motrin, they're giving them 50 or 100 Oxycontin or oxycodone, and then the kid gets addicted. Then the kid goes to the street and he buys pills, he buys heroin, he buys this, he buys that. So there has to be a shift in policy. I know the current administration is applying more money to treatment and other types of like, you know, fentanyl strips and Narcan, and that's all fine. But 
you got to shut down that supply right now because it's overwhelming. Law enforcement is seizing record levels of drugs coming in from Mexico, and the kids are dying at record levels. So we have to do a lot more right now. As we do the education, we do the rehabilitation, the treatment, we have to shut down the cartel's ability to produce. Because look, if ISIS or Al-Qaeda was producing deadly chemical weapons in Mexico, we wouldn't sit back and let it happen. We would Mm -hmm. go after it. And right now, we're not going after it. And we haven't gone after it for years. So we have to pick up the pace and we have to be more aggressive because our kids are dying like we've never seen before in the history of the country. And social media is pushing it also. Social media needs yes. to social media company. Right. They, they're being yeah. sued. And, and that's why, let me tell you, I'm glad you brought that up. I said it briefly in my presentation. The reason more and more young kids are dying is because they're all on their phones. They're all texting. They're on Instagram, Snapchat, social media sites. And the bad guys are taking advantage of that. And that's why they're dying and they're getting the deliveries right to the house. Mm-hmm. So you could be a parent in your house and your kid's upstairs. You think he's doing homework and he's actually ordering up a fake pill because he's depressed or he's anxious. So there has to be more engagement with the community. And you made some really good points. So thank you. Derek, I'll, I'll, uh, I've got one other question coming up. Uh, Andrew Trufka, I was going to say that the other end of shutting off the supply is to shut off uh, as much as we can the demand so yes. the education of our kids to, to not do it if if the if the market dries up then the supply is going to dry 100 percent. that's uh, that's right conrad andrew uh trofka you've got a question go ahead uh, can you hear me okay yes can you hear me? okay i can't turn my uh video on um, I live in Rancho Mirage, California, and Mexicali is only about an hour drive. And I'm involved with a uh, with a group of nuns. It's called Border Compassion, and we're going to the shelters in Mexicali um, to work with the immigrants, the migrants who are waiting to to cross over legally. And what shocked me when I first started going there, I thought everybody'd be coming from Central America and Colombia, the greatest number are people coming from Michoacan, Guerrero, these Mexican states. It's like, a, and they're what they're, the, the stories they're telling are just horrendous. It's like a war zone um, in those states. And why is our government not going in there to start working with the Mexican government? Um, from what I understand, there's just so much corruption um, with these cartels that they pay off the local officials. Why is our government not going in there and working with the Mexican government? Uh- so, so Andrew, that's a great question. I wish I can answer it, but I will tell you that as we're speaking right now, the uh, former head of the Mexican public security, our equivalent to the FBI, is on trial in the Eastern District of New York He's been charged with what we call a continuing criminal enterprise because as he was in charge of the Mexican police force, he was working with Chapo Guzman and the Sinaloa cartel. We also arrested in 2020 the Secretary of Defense of Mexico, Salvatore Cienfuegos, because he was working with the Sinaloa cartel as well. So there's very deep-rooted corruption in Mexico. It's The drug trafficking is a big part of their economy. They actually are making billions and billions of dollars right now from the migrant smuggling. They're making billions and billions from the drug smuggling and business couldn't be any better for the Mexican cartels. And they are operating with impunity. So I don't know why the current government is not doing more with Mexico. In my opinion, they should be down there at very high level meetings to put pressure on Mexico and start threatening to pull back resources if they don't work better and smarter and harder against the cartel. But unfortunately, the president of Mexico right now has what he calls hugs, no bullets policy against the cartels. The cartels run Mexico. That's the bottom line. And they have the greatest military weapons. They have drones. They have tanks. They have explosives. They have RPGs. They dismember people. They throw people in acid. They destroy lives left and right. They kill innocent kids. They kill mothers. They kill grandmas. They don't care. 
and they're getting away with it. And that's my whole point. They must be declared as terrorist organizations and we must use some sophisticated technology, help the Mexicans and destroy their ability to operate. At the same time, as Conrad said, which is very well said, we must educate, we must have mandatory education in middle schools and high schools in this country to at least let kids know, because no kid in America, well, I shouldn't say no kid, the vast majority of kids are not watching mainstream media and cable news. They watch Instagram, they watch social media videos, they watch videos, and they're not watching any of this stuff that we're talking about. So they don't know. And unless the parents are telling them, the kids are basically running blind. You know, when I was a kid, we made mistakes. Everyone on this call made mistakes. But we learned from mistakes. We didn't die from mistakes. And the kids need a better, uh, you know, support mechanism around them. And right now, people are failing in this country at record levels. But let me make it clear. I watched the cartels in America, the corporate cartels, starting to dump this stuff under the George Bush administration. And I watched what happened throughout the Obama, the Trump, and now the Biden administration. So they all have, there's plenty of blame to go around. But we need to now make it better. We need to do something positive now. But we need the community. We need folks like you to step it up and help. Derek, Derek just one point. I, Derek, I, did, just one. I did see uh, uh, on one of your maps there, there is, and it's not entirely focused out of Mexico. I know that's probably one of the worst areas, but there's also crossing the borders from Canada. Is that? Oh, is absolutely. That absolutely. Too? That's a really good point, Conrad. Like Canada, there's there's Chinese lab operators in Canada that are making fentanyl as well. And it's very easy to cross into America for the northern border now because a lot of the resources have been moved from the northern border to the southern border. So it's very porous in the northern border and the bad guys are taking advantage of that as well, unfortunately. Derek, one last point. Um, Derek, yeah. one one thing I'm doing here, we have a new Republican congressman, Ken Calvert, and his one of his agendas is to secure the border. And I think this he needs to be aware of this. So I think we have to start advocating calling our local congressmen and senators and letting them know about this so that they start putting heat on them. A hundred percent. I participate in conferences all the time in Washington with all these congressmen, I've testified at different committees and I'm trying my best to do it, but for some reason it's not resonating. And it's really sad because I talk to thousands of families on a regular basis and they're all very sad that they never knew about fentanyl. And that's the biggest issue. Folks, anybody have any other question? Oh, looks like Richard, uh, let's see, when Kilgore and then Richard Williams. Go ahead, uh, Wynn. Wynn? Are you muted? Okay, Richard Williams, go ahead. I have a simple question. What do you do with all these pills when you seize them? So what happens is when the DEA or other law enforcement uh, makes these seizures, what they do is they keep a sample for court they need the evidence, so they take pictures, they, they, keep, they keep a representative sample, and then they bring them to the incinerator, and they burn all the drugs, whether it's pills, cocaine, marijuana, heroin, methamphetamine, they just destroy all the drugs. When you do that, aren't you, isn't the air, the, the air from these drugs going into the atmosphere to affect everybody? Because that was my concern. Richard, I wish I could answer that. I don't, I'm not an expert in that area. I mean, honestly, it's a good question, but I just don't know the answer. I mean, I would think and I would hope that people in the labs of the DEA and other agencies have thought through what you're asking, but I just don't know. Um, I really don't know the answer to that. Because I see where it's burning. If you're burning it, it's going into the air. Yeah. The same air as the air that we're breathing. Yeah. Good so point. It would affect us too. Now, yeah. you put it in the water to dissolve it, is worse because it's going down the drain. Yeah. To the streams. I agree with you. It's environmental concern. It definitely makes sense. But I, I would think and I would hope uh, that the experts in the labs, the chemists and everything, 
that they've thought through it, but I, I just can't answer that. That's not my area of expertise. Okay. When did, when did you want to uh, go did ahead and you ask your now? question? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, just to say a little bit about myself quickly. I grew up on the border and uh, I've lived in a border state all my life. Uh, and I had my first question as we talked about drugs coming in other than through the Southern border, but what percentage of these uh, pills are being uh, found and confiscated and what, what percentage of the fentanyl, and we haven't got, even got into human trafficking yet, but just the fentanyl, what percentage of that is, in fact, coming through the southern border? Well, again, that's another question. Is an old saying, we don't know what we don't know, right? Okay. So what the experts at the border have determined is that about 10% of what's coming in is seized. So if you look at, for example, oh. last year alone, if the DEA alone sees 50 million fake pills, that means there were 500 million that came in. So it's kind of unknown. We don't know when, but let's just say this. If we seized like 14,000 pounds by the Border Patrol and CBP at the border, there's hundreds of thousands of pounds that have gotten in. And that's the scary part. So it would seem to me like we really have no reasonable alternative to make a dent in this problem until we stop this traffic coming across the border. Right. Now, I know it's going to take a lot of money and a lot yeah. of personnel. Right. And we have to be empathetic to the people that are trying to escape a, a terrible situation yeah. in Mexico, but we've got to do it. Well, here's the thing. The U.S. military and the intelligence community is very, very powerful and the technology is very awesome. And they have the ability to do precision strikes just like they did against ISIS and Al-Qaeda sure. without having casualties of innocent people. So if you know where a cartel lab is in Culiacan, Mexico, you could actually do the strikes, you know, working with the Mexicans, providing the technologies. And that's what I would hope, because we have to disrupt their ability to distribute and import the poison to our kids in America. That's the priority for me right now. I understand. Of course, that that means that we're going to have operations, American operations going in into a sovereign nation. And that has its own difficulties. Yeah. Certainly, we, we need to we need to act and, and all all of the above, in my opinion. Yes, hundred percent. Well, thank you. The old the old saying that knowledge is power. The more we, at least now, I hope all of you, the forty or so plus that have been on tonight, have some more knowledge than you had before you joined the webinar tonight about this issue, and how scary and fearful it is. With that knowledge, then we now have the ability to talk intelligently about it with our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, and especially our government officials that we rely on. And hopefully we can get the message across and make a dent in this. I saw somebody else was waving their hand. Who was it? Um, um, it was just me, Harry. Oh, again. David uh, Penley. Oh, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Who was that? I, I noticed sometimes what politics get into the mix, and we have to be uh, be mindful of when we use certain languages in terms of because with the dysfunction going on in, in Congress, how are you going to get job the job done or get to fight this evil this pandemic going on? Because I think we sometimes the narrative is is, is pitted against about the immigration issue or is drug issue. So we have to be clear, what is our target? What are we focusing on? Is it going to be the drug and whatever? But I think because of the politics is so stagnant and, um, you know, we, we know what I'm trying to say. We have to be mindful of what we're going. And I think the laws that were created for the war and crime, you know, back in the 90s, that may be tough and crime because the young people, as I mentioned earlier, they are getting their information. They're doing the buying and those stuff on social media. When I was a social worker in the school, the kids who were taking psychotropic medication were the ones selling to their friends. And I think that's where the addiction follow, the, 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 the trend started. So we have to sort of work with the, um, the social media platform and maybe pull them aside because I think that's the one is falling in the rise of the pandemic. Thank so we you. have to address those. Thank you, Harry. Appreciate it. I'm trying to get in these last couple of questions before we, uh, with some other folks. David Penley, go ahead. 
Uh, you're muted. If you can unmute. David, unmute, and then you can ask your question. Next up, uh, Sam Amare uh, from St. Benedict's. I'll get you on next. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I just had a question for Garrett. Thank you for the information. One of the stats I wrote down, you said 107,000 deaths in 2021. Was that total overdoses or overdoses due to fentanyl? Good question. That is the total drug overdoses, and they estimate if the CDC was asked, they estimate about 70% are from fentanyl. But like okay. I showed in one of my slides, just in Ohio alone, it was closer to 90% from fentanyl. So my personal opinion is that it's probably more like 85 to 90% is fentanyl related because there's really no there's really no heroin now coming into America. There's really no cocaine even coming into America. It's all tainted with fentanyl. So the vast majority is going to be from fentanyl. There's still going to be some kids that are dying from pills that they're taking that are real pills that they're getting. But the majority, and by the way, for whatever this is worth, the families that have lost their kids are very upset about the lack of accurate and timely reporting from the CDC. When COVID was going on, every night we, woke, we put our TV on, we saw COVID deaths, we saw COVID cases. Now we can't even get timely statistics on fentanyl deaths. So this is another big thing that's going on right now. And it's really, really sad because it shouldn't be that difficult from an autopsy report that could determine it's fentanyl. And let's start reporting it timely and accurately. So that's another thing that the families are working on. Good deal. Thank, Thank you. you. Derek, uh, Sam, uh, go ahead. Sam Amray. Hello. He's on mute. He may be muted. Yes, he is muted. Looks like he's frozen, need, too. You, uh, 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 yeah, we've got his hand up, but I'll ask him to unmute. Um, well, uh, we are right at the uh, the end of the hour, and I, I know that this is a subject that we probably could be continuing to talk about for many hours tonight. But um, hopefully, it's given you some some uh, information that maybe you had not been fully aware of. At least it's uh, it is um, scary and frightening information, and. Um, it does not seem like at this time it has begun to be abated or slow down at all. It's continuing to increase. And um, anything that we can do in, uh, in our missions with, uh, with our youth and with young people and young men and young women to uh, caution them about the, the, how fatal this thing is. And please, please, let's try and stem the the uh, so not the supply as much we can't do so much with that but we can sure help to try and influence the demand for it um i'll uh, close us here in prayer if um if that's okay and then uh like i said we will have this uh recording uh posted up on our website within uh probably 48 hours so if you'd like to show it to other people show it in your own chapter meetings uh, feel free to. We'll have it up there so you can just click on it and show it to them. And uh, please spread it to your family members too, and neighbors, and anybody that you think might be influenced by what they what you've seen here tonight. And pass so on to your school board or, or local government. Yeah, every, every, we need to spread everywhere. Thank you. Um, and again, Derek, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. You're a busy man. I was just uh, so happy to be able to nab you for an hour tonight. And it's been great having you. We'll, uh, uh, and we've got your information if folks need to or want to send you an email or reach out to you uh, for another speaking or, or just to hear you. Um, please, uh, we'll, we'll get that on the website too. Thank you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. with you. Keep watch, dear Lord, those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Please tend to the sick, Lord Christ, and give rest to the weary. 
bless the dying and soothe the suffering and pity the afflicted and shield the joyous and all for your love's sake. Amen. 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 Thank you, brothers. Appreciate all of you attending and uh, we'll have Thank another you. big webinar coming next month. Okay, thank yeah. you. Just mark thank it on your calendars. The first Wednesday night of every month. <laughs> very, very informative. I really am glad that I was invited. Thank you. Thank you. I had no idea you. stuff like that was going on. Thank you. Thank you. Derek, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Where'd you go? Oh, there he's dropped off. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and drop the link. There we go. All right.